2 Corinthians 4 is where we're turning tonight. When you find your place in 2 Corinthians 4, a continuation really of this morning's message, then uh, we want to turn over to look at the passage about our Lord's table and just sort of see the connections. And I think there is a strong connection here in the way the Apostle Paul is bringing this forward. By the way, the lesson that Pastor Rod has written for next Sunday morning in Sunday school, very strong connection with that. Teachers, as you hear this about thankfulness, pay attention because in the uh, recorded session he did for you this afternoon, I think there's some really strong connections. So if you found your place there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, go back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and the passage that we routinely refer to about our Lord's table. And notice the connection here when the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks... Now let that settle in on your hearts for just a few moments as you think about this. I don't know about you, but every time I come to the Lord's table and I want to examine my heart, I, I begin with questions like, Lord, where have I betrayed you recently? Where, where have I failed to live for you? Where have I failed to really honor you? And here's the Lord Jesus, and this is how great the grace is. The grace is so great that in the night that he would be betrayed, he took the bread, it says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. So tonight as we come in a spirit of self-examination, let's go back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And on this Easter Sunday, just remember and recognize the spirit of faith, that <clears throat> same spirit of faith that we learned about in this morning's message in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that we see recorded there in verse 13. Let's begin with verse 13 and go down through verse 15. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you for all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound or abound to the glory of God. Shall we pause together to pray? Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, then, for your abundant grace poured out upon us for all eternity. We will be praising you and thanking you for your marvelous, abundant grace. Help us tonight, Lord, to be able to apprehend that for which we have been apprehended, that we might take hold of you and understand the greatness of what you have done in order that we might give thanks and give glory to God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight's message then is entitled Abundant Grace. There is a, a manuscript out there in the foyer for those of you online. You can go online to the sermons page and see Abundant Grace. In our Easter Sunday morning message, we really went through verses 13 and 14 and really learned what it meant to say in the same spirit of faith. And we highlighted the fact that the Apostle Paul, going through his sufferings, his afflictions, he was not downcast nor destroyed. And one of the reasons he was able to go through with such power was that he was clinging to Psalm 116 and verse 10. And he was thinking in terms of the psalmist said he was afflicted. And he said, I believed, therefore have I spoken. It's like the psalmist would say, another psalmist would say, I would have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
as the Apostle Paul is going through these episodes of life, he is thinking in terms of specific scriptures. There is a model for every one of us, dearly beloved. There's exactly the way that we should go through life. If we want to go through with this kind of faith, it must be a scriptural faith, a, a, a faith that is the spirit of faith, as the Apostle Paul says in this passage. But tonight what we want to do is focus on uh, really the last part of verse 14 and into verse 15. Go back to verse 14 and notice that he says, you know this. You, this is what you know. And in Romans chapter 6, remember he uses those three verbs, knowing and reckoning, or we might say today computing, considering, knowing, reckoning, and yielding. Here he's saying, here's the way that you could have this spirit of faith. Here's how you could go the, through the problems of this coming week in the spirit of Easter faith, shall we say, the spirit of the resurrection Sunday faith. He says, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. I noted briefly this morning that this passage is speaking not only of Christ's resurrection and our coming resurrection, but also at least implied here is our coming glorification. When he says, he shall present us with you. Now the scriptures give you some really wonderful hints about this. I don't know that there is just one passage that you could turn to where you would see it explicated. Here's what, here's what glorification means. Say in the way that 1 Corinthians 15 would say, describe and explain the resurrection. But certainly there are a number of passages. Uh, Romans chapter 8 comes to mind immediately. Remember in that passage, there are three groaning observers. It mentions that, that we groan within ourselves and all creation groans and even the Spirit of God groans with, with groanings which cannot be uttered. And, and what are they all groaning about? Why, why this groaning? Well, he tells you in Romans chapter 8 that all creation is groaning, longing for the manifestation of the sons of God. You say, what does that mean exactly? It's speaking of the believer's glorification. And what he's saying is this old creation is just longing for the manifestation, the presentation of the sons of God, the glorified sons of God. And why would that be? Well, the Bible tells us that we are the first fruits of the new heaven and new earth. It comes out in passages like James 1.18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. In other words, when the Lord transforms us by his salvation, when he changes us, what happens in us is the first little indication, the first fruit, if you will, of the coming new heaven and new earth. That comes out in passages like Romans chapter 13, when he says the night is far spent, the day is at hand. So clearly he's talking about the darkness of this world, the coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the millennium, eternity before us. He says the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Then he says, let us therefore walk honestly as in the day. Now the first question would be, whoa, 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 whoa. The day hasn't come yet. How is it that we're to walk honestly as in the day? And one of the applications I think he's making there is we having the Holy Spirit in us, within us even now, we could today walk honestly, appropriately as in that day. In other words, we have everything we need to do God's will presently. So this is the spirit in which he is pressing forward in this passage with this understanding of glorification. Probably one of the very best passages that you could go to would be 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2 when you speak of glorification. I love the way John puts this. He says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, Beloved, now we are the sons of God. Wait, how do we become the sons of God? John, John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. You say, hey, that's kind of an intriguing phrase there about our coming glorification. Well, 
there's a few little hints. If you, if you want to explore these few little hints and just trying to work through, for instance, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he appeared in a room that was locked, how did that happen exactly? I mean, what exactly happened there? And you say, well, uh, I think, uh, you know, he had, a, he had a glorified body, right? And that's one of the things that intrigues us is in our glorification, you say, well, we'll be, we'll be eating, you know, will we actually eat food in a glorified body? Remember what Jesus said to his disciples? He said, have you any fish? And he actually ate things right there in front of them. And so there's at least some indication that, yes, there's nourishment going on. You have the, the tree of life that produces a different fruit every month. You have the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nation. Does that imply that we're going to be bruised? I don't know, playing football or, or you know, something else? I don't know. I don't know exactly how. We don't know enough to say, hey, here's exactly what's going on. But the idea here is... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Again, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know. There's that word know again. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The psalmist talked about this. He said, I will be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. So for this evening's meditation, what we want to do is we want to turn to that last verse, verse 15, and really concentrate on what is it that Jesus is really getting across to us here through the teaching, preaching of the Apostle Paul. What is it that we really ought to take hold of specifically for this evening's Lord's Table? Whenever we come to the Lord's table, we want to exalt or accentuate something about Jesus Christ. And clearly from this passage tonight, what we would exalt about him is that he is our suffering servant. Now, this is evident through the Apostle Paul, who is trying to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and basically being a model for all of us as well. Look, if you will, at verse 15. When the Apostle Paul says, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound or abound to the glory of God. That one verse tonight is our concentrated meditation. So let's stop to think about it. The Apostle Paul says, for all things are for your sake. When Dr. Manning was here this last week as he was preaching, he said, you know, it's one thing to present yourself as a servant. It's quite another for somebody else to treat you like a servant. You say, okay, well, look, now, I'm a servant, but you don't have to treat me like a servant. Look at the way the Apostle Paul is approaching this. He is saying, all things are for your sakes. How could he say such a thing? Because he followed the Lord who did all these things for our sake. This morning in the Sunday school lesson that Pastor Rod put together for us, we were looking at 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 9. What do we learn there? Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet he made himself poor for our sakes that we might be made rich. So when he says here, for all things are for your sake, what he's manifesting is that same attitude, that same servant heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the same spirit of faith that we were speaking of this morning. But in this case, this same spirit of faith, this attitude of dependence on the Lord, is actually causing him to say, hey, I have the same spirit of faith. And tonight, what he's fo we're focusing on is it's a serving faith. It's a serving spirit of faith that really helps you and me to press through these things. The way the Apostle Paul explained it to Timothy over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses one, uh, verse 10, I should say, is he says, Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. That's the way the Apostle Paul thought about it. He said, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. 
In the recent Sunday school lesson, we talked about the matter of biblical election. We just talked about how routinely the Lord used that word interchangeably for the word believer or Christian or disciple. He used the word the elect. The apostle Paul is saying here, I endure all things for the elect's sake. So to reflect what you see there in verse 15, for all things are for your sake. Now look, here's what ought to happen to us tonight. What ought to happen to us tonight is when we think about our Lord's table and we think about how much he has served us, that Jesus Christ himself is saying to us, for all things are for your sake. And here's the apostle Paul saying, for all things are for your sake. And when you and I look down through the long hall, the long hall of the heritage that we have of servants of God who have served us and taught us, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And what would they echo down that heritage hall, if you will? What they would echo to us is this. All things are for your sake. We did this for you. And as you and I are reminded often from the scripture, from the gospel of Luke, to whom much is given, of him shall much be required. To whom anyone would give much, he will expect much from him. So when you, not, you and I think about this tonight, just think about this servant spirit in the way that the Apostle Paul went about it, serving selflessly for the sake of others. He had been criticized, Paul had, you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, what was it the orators were saying about him? His bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible and they were just aiming all these criticisms. He was treated despitefully. But as we saw this morning, the theme of 2 Corinthians is God's strength in our weakness. And so what the Apostle Paul was demonstrating to all of them is this is how a true servant of God would go through suffering. You and I are very familiar with a number of TV evangelists and people on television that it's, it's always positive. It's always good. They'll never say anything negative. But you begin to ask and you begin to study their teaching about how would they explain to someone how to go through suffering, how to go through affliction? And you're going to find basically silence, right? Crickets. The Apostle Paul is saying that is the very essence of the matter. The very essence of the matter is watch how a servant of God goes through sufferings. Watch how they go through difficulties. And he's doing this, as you and I learned about our precious Lord, Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. So I think this is why the Apostle Paul is saying, for all things are for your sakes. By the way, this is a very helpful way to think about success. When you think about the believers around you right now, and you think about all of us standing at the judgment seat of Christ, biblical success is, did you and I consider one another and stir up or provoke each other to love and good works in such a way that those around us have gold and silver and precious stones at the judgment seat of Christ? That implies that they had the right actions, they had the right attitudes, that you and I were useful in helping them press on for the glory of God. There's biblical success, my friends. I think that's why the Apostle Paul is saying here, all things are for your sakes. He was absolutely delighted to be able to give himself over to this. And as I noted there in your outline, and I would point out again for those of you watching online, this story is there as well. This kind of attitude can really be contagious, especially in very adverse circumstances. I have a book in my library called War and Grace. I think Pastor Rod bought a copy of it as well. It has some tremendous illustrations in it. And one of them is about a man named Ernest Gordon. Ernest Gordon wrote a book that really helped people to kind of work through the grace of God when he, he gave the stories about Through the Valley of Kwai. Now, many of you have seen or heard of the film The Bridge Over the River Kwai. He's very careful to say, Ernest Gordon was very careful to say in that book, that's not the way it was. We, we were not uh, through some sort of... Uh, altruism trying to help the Japanese build a bridge. He said it didn't happen that way. But nevertheless, that's the way the Hollywood producers put it together. But they were under very adverse circumstances. Ernest Gordon, not yet a believer, 
was watching and listening to see how those who were Christians among them, how they would go through suffering. And so I was reading a book here recently by uh, Tim Hansel called Holy Sweat. Here's what he said. In Ernest Gordon's true account of the life of, of his life in World War II Japanese prison camp that's entitled Through the Valley of Kwai, there is a story that never fails to move me. It's about a man who, through giving it all away, literally transformed a whole camp of soldiers. Remember this morning we looked at Matthew, or briefly I referred to Matthew chapter 16. He that saves his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake, the same shall find it. That's the kind of story that you're getting ready to hear here. The man's name was Angus McGilvery. Angus was a Scottish prisoner, one of the camps filled with Americans and Australians and Britons who helped to build the infamous bridge over the River Kwai. The camp had become an ugly situation. It was a dog-eat-dog -dog mentality that had set in. Allies would literally steal from each other and cheat each other. Men would sleep on their packs and yet have them stolen out from under their heads. Survival was everything. The law of the jungle prevailed until the news of Angus McGilvery's death spread throughout the camp. Rumors spread in the wake of his death. No one could believe that Big Angus had succumbed. He was strong, one of those whom they expected to be the very last to die. Actually, it wasn't the fact of his death that shocked the men, but the reason he died. Finally, they pieced together the true story. The Argyles, these are the uh, Scottish soldiers. It may be Argyles, uh, like the Sox, so I may be mispronouncing that took their buddy system very seriously. Their buddy was called their mucker, and these Argyles believed that it was literally up to each of them to make sure their mucker, their buddy, survived. Angus's mucker, was, though he was dying, uh, was everyone had given him up. Everyone had given him up except for Angus. Angus had made up his mind that his friend would not die. Someone had stolen his buddy's blanket, so Angus gave him his own, telling him that he had come across an extra one. Likewise, every mealtime, Angus would get his rations and take them to his friend and stand over him and force him to eat them, again stating that he was able to get extra food. Angus was, was going to do anything and everything to see his buddy got what he needed to recover. But as Angus's mucker began to recover, Angus collapsed and slumped over and died. The doctors discovered that he had died of starvation complicated by exhaustion. He had been giving of his own food and shelter. He had given everything he had, even his very life. Now, before we go on with the story, just ask yourself the question, how would that affect those around you? This author, Tim Hansel, said the ramifications of his acts of love and unselfishness had a startling impact on the compound. And he quoted John 15, verse 12, greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. As the word circulated of the reason for Angus McGilvery's death, McGilvery's death, the feel of the camp began to change. Suddenly, Men began to focus on their mates, their friends, and humanity of living beyond survival, of giving oneself away. They began to pool their talents. One was a violin maker, another was an orchestra leader, another a cabinet maker, another a professor. And soon the camp had an orchestra full of homemade instruments and a church called the Church Without Walls. I'm quoting from memory here, but I believe it was in that assembly, the church without walls, that Ernest Gordon actually came to know the Lord. That church without walls was so powerful, so compelling, that even the Japanese guards attended. The men began a university, a hospital, a library system. The place was transformed, and all but smothered love revived, all because one man named Angus gave all he had for his friend. For many of those men, this turnaround meant survival. What happened in an awesome illustration of the potential unleashed when one person actually gives it all away. That is an awesome illustration. When you think then about this kind of giving, all things are for your sakes. 
you can really see that illustrated in that Japanese World War II prison camp. Just think about Angus McGilvery's attitude as the very same attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was contagious, and everyone learned to think differently. So let's ask about the rest of the verse. What does it mean then to be serving selflessly with abundant grace? I mean, that's where Paul's headed with this. All things are for your sake that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Now let's just be really practical here for a second and just kind of talk about this. There are many of you who do your best. You serve the Lord and you try to honor the Lord and you give and give and give and give. And there are people who will say to you, I am so grateful to you. I Listen, I, I really appreciate you. I mean, the, the hard work you do actually blesses me, encourages me. And I just want you to know, it really means a lot to me. You're very good service to me. And I just like to ask this question. Would you keep on doing that? Because you really make me feel great when you do that. There is one attitude, okay? That one is sort of like the glass ceiling. I mean, it's like, it's, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. And hey, I really appreciate all you're doing for me. But there's another attitude, the attitude I think would really honor the Lord, that when we see others giving and giving and giving and, and sacrificing themselves and honoring the Lord, not only to express appreciation and thankfulness for it, but also to say, I'd like to learn how to be like you. You see, the Apostle Paul learned how to be like Jesus Christ. You and I could learn how to be like Jesus Christ. You say, hold it, Jesus Christ was God. Okay, if you say, I don't think I can be like Jesus Christ, well then could we be like Paul? Could we be like Barnabas? Could we be like a whole host of other examples? And actually learn to get in the harness and serve and go right through the glass ceiling. That sort of glass ceiling that's imposed of, I do this much and I can't do any more. When in fact, it would be really amazing to see the abundant grace, the, the overflowing grace. This passage is just overflowing. When he says redound, the idea is abound to the glory of God. What if through members of the congregation saying, look, I, I want to be a servant. I want to throw myself into the task. Just think about how that would affect those around you. Pastor Rod mentioned this next Sunday evening, what we'd like to do is make a presentation to you. We're going to be working pretty hard on this this week. It involves some activities that we have coming up. It involves the potential for a mission trip to some foreign state called Minnesota. Am I right? It's Minnesota, isn't it? So we're a camp swampy where Pastor Rod's going to be the, the director up there. We need both adults and teens that would be willing to go. Troy Manning gave us at, at our request last week, we said, hey, you're three and a half hours away. Is there anything we can do as a congregation that would actually be a blessing? They actually went through and took pictures of various maintenance needs in their building and said, hey, we, we would be very much uh, interested in uh, having help if you could come and help us. We're working on this. This is one of those good Lord willing and the COVID don't rise <clears throat> kind of situation. Boy. My voice gave away right as I was saying that. Uh, we are praying earnestly about having a uh, family camp this coming. I'm so glad they put the water bottle up here just for a situation just like this. We're praying about having a family camp this summer. And what the deacons have wisely recommended to us is that we actually get the tent like we had for, I think it was the fifth Sunday fellowship back in August. Am I thinking right? Or September, somewhere around in there. Uh, we're praying about setting up a tent out here on the field and actually canvassing in the neighborhoods and telling folks, hey, here's what we're planning to do. We're planning to have some skit times and fun times, the kind of uh, string ensembles you see up here playing in our services to get together and uh, put together some things like that. Those of you who'd like to be involved in, in skits and learning to work together and have some fun time that could not only be used for the family camp, but also potentially for future mission trips. That's the kind of thing that we're thinking about. And I'll tell you why, because in, there are so many people in this room who could stand up and testify right now, look, 
I went on one of those mission trips and I'll never be the same as a result because what they were doing was in the sense of Psalm 62, five saying, my soul wait thou only upon God for my expectations are from him giving up their rights and expectations. They threw themselves into the task and they will never be the same. I'll never be the same from having been on those various trips. That's the kind of thing that we'd like to talk to you about, about what could we do to help our brothers and sisters in Christ? And what could we do to evangelize? In this case, third through seventh graders, I think it is up at uh, Camp Swampy. The apostle Paul here is saying, here's what, I, here's what I wanna just get across. He's saying, all things are for your sake. In other words, he's giving himself selflessly to the others. And why is that again? that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. When the apostle Paul thought about this abundant grace, it's helpful to think about the way he thought about it. So would you hold your place there and go back three chapters, look back at second Corinthians chapter one, verse 12, just for a moment, so that we clearly understand the way he's thinking about this grace of God. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12, the way God's grace had affected him, he says, for our rejoicing, so this gives him joy, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, he's speaking there not with complex pagan philosophy or even complex human rhetoric is what he's driving at. He says, no, our rejoicing is that the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by, but by what? But by the grace of God, that we had our conversation, the word there is conduct, we had our conduct in the world, and catch this, and more abundantly toward you. You hear it? It just keeps coming out. And more abundantly toward you. So the Apostle Paul is saying, this is the simplicity of the gospel. Jesus Christ saves sinners just like me. He rose again from the dead. We have eternity before us. All things are for your sake. And he's saying, you know what I can do now? I can, I can serve with, with clarity of my conscience, with a conscience that's been cleansed, with simplicity, with godly sincerity. I don't need the complexity of all the human rhetoric and all the other philosophical arguments. I don't need all that. He says, what do I have? He says, I have the grace of God. I have the grace of God, and then he goes on to say, and so my conduct is even more abundantly toward you. No need for showy rhetoric. He is throwing himself into serving others. This is the same kind of attitude that the Apostle Paul pointed to in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember when it speaks of Jesus as a servant in Philippians chapter 2, he says uh, that he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, Right before that, in chapter two, verse five, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, the appeal is that every one of us would look at Jesus Christ, the suffering servant, and we also would be willing to be servants because that's exactly how the abundant grace of God overflows and spills over into the lives of others. So this evening, when we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we think about the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, this ought to really resonate with all of us tonight, that when we see what our precious Lord went through, we, we see the amazing way that he went through this and gave thanks, you and I ought to sit back and say, wow. This was all for my sake. Glory to God for that, but don't stop at the glass ceiling. Not only, wow, this was all for my sake, that the abundant grace, the abundant grace would lead to thanksgiving, people giving thanks to the glory of God and ultimately glorifying him. 
So may I appeal to you tonight as we take our Lord's table together that number one, you would exalt him as the suffering servant. And number two, that you would say, I'd like to be a servant like my Savior. Can we bow our heads together, please? And in just a few moments, our musician is going to play quietly and give us a time for just careful self-examination. We do this because in the light of the scriptures, as the scriptures are presented, undoubtedly the Holy Spirit of God uses that to remind folks about something in their hearts, something that stands between them and the Savior. This is the right time to deal with that. The scripture tells us not to take of this table unworthily or in some sort of ritual or casual manner as if it's just sort of a toss off. That's, that's absolutely false, folks. What he's saying here is, so let a man examine himself and then let him take of this table and of this cup. And so I would ask you this evening then to take some time for very careful self-examination and most especially ask this question. Am I serving the way that my savior servant would want me to? When you and I think of sin, we ought to think in terms of sins that we have committed and obedience that we have omitted. You and I have to ask tonight, Lord, in the light of what you've shown me from the word of God, am I being a servant? I'll pray together with you and then ask the gentlemen if they would come forward and then our musician will play quietly. Lord, thank you so much for helping us to understand the nature of this abundant grace tonight. We are so moved to see the testimony of the Apostle Paul, who said freely, all things are for your sakes. But he did so in order that through this amazing abundant grace, thanksgiving would be given so that people would abound to the glory of God with thankfulness. Help us then tonight to honor the one who gave thanks. He did this all for us in order that we might this evening be grateful and be like him and determine that to the glory of God, we also will be servants. Thank you for the testimony of men like Angus McGilvery. Thank you for the way that it affected others. And dear Lord, I pray this evening that as we think about a summer of service and we think about the opportunities that are before us, that you would help every one of us to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And Father, we will glorify you for all eternity, for that abundant grace that you have overflowed and are overflowing through our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name.